Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. Imagine living in the 1850s. Minnesota was about to become a state and growing your own vegetables was a necessity because there were few stores. Join me on Prairie Yard and Garden as we learn about growing enough food to survive our long winters. Today I have with me uh, Andrea Christ, who is the site interpreter here at the Oliver Kelly Farm in Elk River, Minnesota. And boy, did you have to wear that back in the 1850s? Yes, um, this is typical dress for a lady of the time period. Um, all of the girls in the family would be fully covered. Actually, men and women were covered um, from head to toe. You didn't have um, you know, any legs showing. You were covered up to your wrists. You had everything up to your neck covered. Um, for women, um, one of the things about the clothing is that it uh, protected the outer garment. You know, you only owned two, maybe three dresses, one of those being a nice Sunday dress. Um, so you wanted to protect that outer garment as much as possible because there is yards and yards and yards of fabric which you would have to purchase and you sometimes didn't have that extra money to just make a new dress. So you protected it as much as possible and the way you did that was to wear um, undergarments. And what about that heavy apron? That uh, looks like it gets lots of use. It does. It does. The, the apron's kind of the, the tool for women, um, whether you're cooking and you need it to, to open up a hot stove or um, to wipe off your hands. Uh, I know especially when I'm working in the garden, you know, I use it a lot of times to just kind of gather in produce so I can carry things very easily. So, and again, wipe my hands off too. But. Well, we're here in the 1850s through 1870 period of farming and life on a farm and uh, it looks like we have a huge garden. <laughs> it is almost an acre um, and this would be about the size like the Kelly family would need for six people in order to sustain them for a full year and that's what they were kind of going for is trying to have enough produce that would get them through an entire year. And you only have a really short growing season, um, especially in Minnesota here, it's a lot shorter than in other places. So you have to plant a whole lot um, and hope that it's enough. And so a lot of that was you know, planning ahead, forethought, thinking about um, what was gonna store, what could you use now, what were you gonna use later, um, and then preserving it uh, was the other thing they'd have to take into consideration. What about seed collection? Did people just keep their seeds? Absolutely, they kept seeds. Um, anything that you could very easily do, beans are extremely easy, corn's easy, peas are easy, those are very easy to collect seeds from, so they would definitely um, be collecting the seeds from those. Um, other things that you could collect seeds from, you know, any of your biennials, um, your cabbages, your carrots, um, anything that you had to replant a second year, sometimes they would do that. Um, they'd up, actually uproot the whole plant and and transplant them indoors in the root cellar with some dirt and store them there for during the winter time and then bring them back out and replant them the next year so that they would actually flower. Um, but seeds were available, so you didn't necessarily have to do that, especially on the riverfront here. You know, you had seed uh, or um, shipping availability very easily. And Kelly was um, getting seeds a lot of times from like through the patent office. He worked with them and he would get seeds available that way. They'd send him things to try out. And so, you know, he had access to seeds and he even worked for a seed company at one point in time. So um, 
he had the availability to try a lot of different things. So that would be more um, easily accessible than maybe taking the time to do it yourself. So I think they did it sometimes and they didn't do it at other times. Sure, sure. And one of the challenges being here in Minnesota and being a new territory would be uh, just what's going to grow mm -hmm. because there wasn't a lot of experience prior to this. Right, and so it was a lot of trial and error to see what was actually going to grow. Certain varieties grow better at one location and not another location um, due to the season itself and also due to the soil. You know, this is very sandy soil here, um, and so there are certain things that don't do as well. Um, for Kelly, it ended up being wheat. <laughs> wheat actually didn't grow very well here, and that was the big crop for Minnesota market farmers in the 60s, was growing wheat. And so he had to, he had to make a switch and try to find other things that he could sell. What would be the staple crops in the 1850s, 60s? Um, the biggest things for farmers, especially uh, in Minnesota, again thinking about uh, not only now but also later, would have been root crops. That was their biggest thing. They grew tons and tons of root crops. So that's all of your, your potatoes, your, your rutabagas, your turnips, your beets, um, your radishes, your carrots, uh, parsnips, salsify. Those are all root crops. And, and the reason they would grow a whole bunch of those is because they're very filling. Um, you can get them, some of those varieties get extremely large, which would mean they would store longer in the season. The larger it is, um, not necessarily having the best flavor the larger it is, but it would store. And that's really what they were looking for was produce that was going to last. And so your root crops really were one of the most important things that they would have been uh, planting a whole bunch of. Are there any unique varieties that uh, we wouldn't see today? Um, we do have a few. Um, now, rutabagas aren't a, a very unique variety. We have what's called American Purple Top Rutabaga. Still um, around today, I believe. They are still around. These are our, our rutabagas right here. Um, most people that come into the garden aren't familiar with rutabagas. Uh, you can still find them in the grocery stores. Um, they just look very different. A lot of times the tops and bottoms are cut off and they're all waxed over, which is why nobody recognizes them. Um, but they were extremely important at the time because, again, they were a very bulky root crop that stored a very long time. Um, actually, one of the very unique root crops that we have in here is what is called salsify. It was also known as oyster plant because it sort of had that taste of oyster to it. Um, and Kelly and his wife, um, his second wife, Temperance, they were both from the Boston area. So that would have been, they would have been used to that flavor of oyster and way out here in Minnesota, you're not going to get that. Um, but salsify was a root crop that sort of had that flavor to it. And so um, that would have definitely been something they would have been growing. And we have some here. It looks like grass when it's growing. Really? <laughs> it's very hard to distinguish from weeds sometimes, but um, it gets very, very long um, and it doesn't get very thick. It's not much thicker than um, my thumb, but it's kind of like a carrot in resemblance, except it's white. Well, that's interesting. And how would that be cooked? Um, like all root crops, you can boil it, you can then mash it, you can stew it, you can bake it, um, you can fry it. <laughs> Pretty much root crops, there's no end to what you can do with them. And there were several different recipes um, that they would have been using with all of their root crops. But any of your potatoes, your rutabagas, your parsnips, you, you can pretty much cook them however you want. Pretty much how we would cook potatoes nowadays, um, you can do with all of the root crops. I'm always interested in parsnips. My mother was a great parsnip cook. And we always had them fried in butter. Love that nutty flavor. Uh, apparently it must have been a real staple back in those days. Um, parsnips were very important, um, again, because it was another root crop. Um, but the really neat thing about parsnips is, is you can actually keep them in the ground. You didn't have to harvest them all when frost came. With um, everything in the garden, you really had to pull it in before frost. Uh, some of your root crops, um, even your cabbage, you could leave out after the first or second frost. If it wasn't too hard of a frost, they'd still be fine. Um, but everything else had to be completely removed, and you did want to get everything out before it snowed. Parsnips you didn't have to do that with. You could actually leave them in the ground, they could winter, and then come spring you would have a fresh uh, set of uh, root crops to, to harvest from and to start using. So they were pretty exciting. Um, and they did use them fresh in the, in, the, in the fall, but then a lot of them would also stay in the ground in winter until the spring. And I always heard old timers say that they got sweeter by leaving them in the ground. That is what I have heard. I have never um, compared the two, so I can't personally speak to that, but I have heard that it, it gets sweeter over the winter. Besides root crops, I see a number of other uh, plants here. Uh, what would be the next 
most popular type of thing that was not a root crop? Um, definitely they grew a lot of squash. Um, we have several different varieties. We have a couple winter squash. Um, we have a, a Boston Marrow, which is a big orange winter squash, and then we've got a green Hubbard. Um, and both of those being winter squash, they bulk up in size, and then you could store them um, through the winter, at least uh, several months out of the, uh, the winter. Um, we also have summer squash varieties, and those would be only during the summer. They're fresh use only. You're not planning on storing those. Um, you could possibly pickle them if you wanted to, um, but they're mostly a fresh use. Um, but the squash is another big thing we've got here. We also have a lot of different varieties of peppers. Um, we've got these wonderful green, they look like bell peppers, they're called bullnose, um, and they get very large. Theirs are good for fresh use, they're also good for pickling. Um, one of the things that they would do with um, some of their peppers is they would actually stuff them. They would cut them open and they would stuff them with what we would think of as relish. Um, it's like chopped cabbage and onions and, and peppers and tomatoes. A lot of spices would go into it. But they'd gut out all of the seeds from the center of the pepper and stuff it. And then they'd actually sew it shut. And then the whole thing would go into vinegar and become a pickle. So it would, it would pickle. Um, that process is known as mangoing. And that came from a plant called a mango that we actually grow here on the farm. Um, it kind of resembles a little cucumber. Um, it only gets to be about fist size, and it's, it's dark green usually, and it tastes like a very bland cucumber. Um, it really has no flavor to it, which is why it's not seen anymore nowadays, um, because you really do have to do something to it. And what they did is they would pickle it, and they would do uh, the process that I just described with the pepper, where they'd gut it and they'd stuff it and sew it shut. And because that was the only thing you did with the mangoes, that's the, the process of doing that became known as mangoing. And you can even do it with things like, um, there's recipes to do it with peaches. Where you, where you gut out peaches and you do the same thing. But there's different ingredients that go into it, so it tends to be a sweeter pickle. Um, their pickles at the time were a lot more than just what we think of as dill or, or bread and butter or sweet. Um, they really had a whole range, and it depended on what you were pickling, not just cucumbers. Um, it depended on what additives, what spices you were um, putting into it, what other ingredients you were putting into it, as well as what kind of vinegar you were using. And they were making all of their own vinegar, so you had a lot more than just cider or, or white vinegar like we have nowadays. Oh, I didn't realize that. Lots of different vinegars, huh? Lots of different vinegars, depending on what you threw into the, the barrel. So in, in that barrel and pro processing process, we didn't have jars in those days? Um, they didn't, what we think of as canning nowadays, they, they didn't do. Um, Mason's canning jar did come out in 1858. Um, now that's, you know, 10 years after or 8 years after the Kellys were here on the property. And that's new technology at the time. So it's like all new technology, you know, it, it sometimes works right away and sometimes doesn't, sometimes there's kinks. Um, the whole process of canning that we know nowadays that we understand with doing a, a second boiling and creating a vacuum, they didn't understand that whole process at the time. So, you know, they would put things in jars and they would put a lid on it and they'd put a wax seal on it and that would be what we would think is the closest thing to our modern canning. But what really worked for them was pickling and it was just really taking a big crock, putting vinegar in it and submerging whatever it is you're trying to pickle beneath the vinegar level and then just leaving it. And that's what worked the best and that was a process they had been doing for years, they understood. And so even when the new modern canning jars came out, a lot of times the, the things that you were pickling in your crocks turned out better and didn't go bad as quickly as the things that you put in the jar because you just didn't quite understand that process yet and how it completely worked. Do you think a lot of people got sick in those days? Um, I don't know if botulism would have been a major concern, but uh, that's what comes to my mind. You know, I, people got sick and people still get sick nowadays from different things that go bad. Um, you know, getting sick is just a reality of life, and it was a reality for them. The biggest thing that we have nowadays is we have antibiotics, we have access to doctors and, and more medical understanding than they had at the time. So for sure people did die of things like food poisoning, but they died just as easily from the common cold that we don't die of nowadays. Um, you know, so there's a whole range as what contributed to, to death rates and, and deaths for people. Like I said, part of it, some of it would have been from food, some of it just was just the reality of life. Well, I see a number of different kinds of beans here. What's the story behind beans? 
Um, we have um, several different kinds of beans that we grow here on the property. Um, beans were something that Kelly grew, um, and there are big distinctions as far as what kind of bean it is. There are, there are varieties that are a green bean that we are familiar with where you eat them in, in the, the, the pod. Um, and we have a red valentine bean and we have an early yellow six week bean. Those are both green bean varieties. But we also grow um, dry bean varieties here too. And that's what some of these rows are here, are dry bean varieties where you actually plant them with the intention of letting the plant die. You want it to completely grow and produce the biggest seeds possible so that you can later shell them out um, and then use those as a baking bean. And those were extremely important in the, in the mid-1800s because once they're dried out completely, they will store for years. As long as they don't get wet, you could store them for years. They obviously didn't store them for years because they were eating them or they were selling them off. Um, but that was an important crop and so you would actually leave them in the ground. And we actually have a bunch up on our porch right now that we're drying out and just completely letting um, them all of the moisture that was in the roots completely dry out and then we're going to bag them up and that would be something they would typically do that's sitting and shelling there during the winter time when all of the other garden activities are completely done you have nothing else to do in the garden um, you would sit there and shell and that was actually a, a job a lot of kids ended up doing during the winter time is to shell out um, a lot of the beans uh -huh. but they were because they're a baking bean a dry bean um, they did have a long storage life. And beans were very, very common, especially for Yankee farmers. They ate beans a lot. <laughs> a lot more than we eat beans. <laughs> a good source of protein. It is. It is. And so it probably supplemented the eggs and the meat that was being used also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, Andrea, I see a number of different varieties of tomatoes. Were they popular in that time period? Tomatoes were grown. Um, a lot of people think that tomatoes weren't grown and that's because previous uh, in years, about 50 years earlier, they were still thought as being poisonous. Um, but tomatoes were grown a lot on farms. A lot of times you would use them fresh so you could cut them up and, and add them into soups and stews. Um, you can even bake them. Uh, but what a lot of times they would do as far as preserving them would be to turn them into a sauce, a very, very thick sauce they called ketchup. It's very different from our modern ketchup. It is more like a, a, a salsa. It's very, very thick. Um, and ketchup just kind of uh, was a term for any thick sauce. So you can actually make um, cucumber ketchup. Um, we're just very familiar, familiar with tomato ketchup. Sure. And it was something that they would add into a lot of meals. Um, you know, it wasn't just a little bit here on the side. You, you mixed it in with things. You put it um, with your meats. You put it with your vegetables. So they did grow a lot of tomatoes. We have um, the large red ones here that are very familiar to a lot of people. They just get very, very large. And those are early large reds. Um, the other ones we have are these small ones that are right next to us. And these are the small fruited tomatoes. We have uh, a yellow plum variety, we, we have a yellow pear variety, and we have a red pear variety. And it's just really the shape of it. Um, we're, we're familiar with like cherry tomatoes. Sure. They're nice and round. Um, these actually look like little pears or little plums. Um, but those, you would use them just like you would use large tomatoes. And uh, looks like an excellent crop for you this year. It's very, very productive so far. There are a lot of green ones, yep. um, but we have made some ketchup um, already from a lot of our small ones. Um, the yellow ones turn very, very yellow. Everything's just very yellow ketchup, but it's, it's very good. And uh, how would that be preserved? Um, it sort of is a, a pickling process. You use vinegar in it, um, just so like other, uh, your other vinegars, you would you submerge things in. This one, you actually put the vinegar into it and you do a lot of stewing over top of the stove. So it is kind of like what we would think of as making like a salsa. Well, I see a couple melons here in the garden also. What's the background on those? I mean, I have a tough time growing melons <laughs> nowadays. I don't know how they did it back then. Melons are very hard to grow in Minnesota. Um, just because of our short growing season, it's just the reality um, that you, you're going to get some and you're not going to get some. Um, we have uh, two different varieties of musk melons in the garden right now, very similar to our modern cantaloupe. Um, one is a nutmeg melon, and then the other one is called a Jenny Lind melon. Um, and the Jenny Lind has more of like a, a turban shape to it. Um, and then the nutmegs really do look like cantaloupe. And those will get a little bit of orange on the inside. There's a lot of green to them, though. Um, so when you cut open these varieties, um, we would look at them from the inside and say, oh, that's a honeydew. 
but it's actually a, it's a musk melon variety. Um, so we have those as far as um, musk melons. We also grow some watermelon. We've got an ice cream watermelon. It's way hidden in the back. It's hard to see. Um, it looks like a honeydew on the outside because the lines are so faint. It gets a very light pink color on the inside and it's very, very good when we can actually get them to grow. But again, short growing season. So sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Um, the other melon that we do get a lot of on a regular basis, um, and this is why they actually grew this melon, was a citron. And it really does look like a uh, watermelon. And that's what most people think when they walk in the garden. They say, oh, there's watermelon. It's actually a citron. Um, we don't hear of citron very much anymore because there's really no flavor to it. Citrons really don't have a flavor. So what they would have done um, in Kelly's time was either pickle them, or they would candy them. Um, and those are really the options that they would do. It was, really wasn't a melon that you ate fresh, um, and that's why you don't see it so much anymore. Although, if you're curious about citron, um, our modern fruit cakes that have those really gummy weird things in the center, yeah. that is still citron. It's still made of citron. It's the only place you see citron anymore nowadays. And I would suspect that that particular melon might keep well for it a does. fair amount of time into it does. the midwinter. Well, and one of the advantage back in those days, I suspect, is if the produce was going bad or whatever, it got fed to animals. That was another use for you. Yep, if you didn't use them um, up fast enough, um, and one of the things that they would periodically do, especially women who were in charge of the house, is they would go into the root cellar during the winter time um, and check crops and you know, go through all of the bins, go through all of the, the pickles and, and your vinegars and check to make sure things weren't going bad. And if it was, you pulled it out and if you could still use it, you would use it. If not, it was fed to the animals. Well, uh, can we go take a look at that storage facility? It must be interesting in the way that they found room for all of that. I have a question. What do you recommend for a tropical plant for a hot location in my yard. A great plant for tropical sites, hot locations, is this Penicetum Fireworks. This is a purple form of Penicetum that's a new kind this year. It actually has a stripe on the foliage, and the foliage is pink as well as purple. But it has lots of flowers. It likes hot weather conditions. So dry sites are OK, uh, but really full sun, it will take quite a bit of heat. This plant's native to Africa, so it's used to a lot really hot conditions. It doesn't like cold. So as soon as the frost comes, it's going to die. But it's a great plant for hot sites and containers, uh, south-facing porch. You can put it in a large pot and it will become hundreds of flowers in the summer. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Well, we're in the root cellar now, um, and this is what the families would have used, uh, kind of like our modern refrigeration. So this is, it's down below the ground, it's nice and cool, you keep all the doors, the windows, everything's boarded up so it's nice and dark, so everything can be preserved better. Um, and we're right now in a section where we've actually got some pickles going on right he here, because this is the, the way to preserve things, was to pickle things. Pretty much means just submerging it in vinegar. Um, so we've got right here on the corner, this is the cucumber ketchup that I was mentioning about. You can make uh, different kinds of ketchup. Uh -huh. And so this one, it looks more like a, um, our modern relish. So it's just a lot of um, cucumbers and onions and there's mustard seed and um, a bunch of other spices that are added into it. The big thing is vinegar. Vinegar is the preservative in this case. Would it have been easy to get uh, the various spices? I mean, what, is the boats bringing those as cargo when they come up and down the river? Yes, yes. You could get um, different spices in off of the river. Um, you know, the steam packets were going up and down the river about two times a week, so you had access uh, to put in orders and things so that you could get spices. Any herbs that you wanted, you could grow in your own garden, but spices you really had to order in. Uh-huh. Um, what's in this? One here. This one here. This one's this one's our exciting one. This one's the mangoes. Um, that's those little green fist-sized melons. Um, and this one, these are. And everybody impressive. used a plate to keep things submerged. 
Yes, because anything that comes up above um, the vinegar level and has access to the air is then going to start going bad. It's going to start collecting that bacteria. And so really um, putting a plate on top of it and sometimes even a rock like was on the, the uh, ketchup um, helps to keep everything beneath the vinegar level. And that's another thing ladies were checking for regularly was not just is there bacteria on there, but did any of the vinegar start to evaporate? Do I need to add more in? Um, so having that plate on there, you can see how far it had, it had evaporated. Um, so I'll show you one of these mangoes. So this is a, uh, the mango melon, and this one was gutted, and then it was stuffed, and then the lid's back on, and then the whole thing is sewn shut. And that's really just to keep all the stuffing in there. And so then as it's in the vinegar, the whole thing is just pickled everything including the stuffing it's all pickled and then when you wanted to stick this on a plate all you have to do is just grab the string and just pull it right out because it's been soaking for you know a couple weeks and um, you could just serve it as a whole or you could chop it up and mix it with other things depending on what your your plans for the meal were well it looks like a lot of work so in the back they probably would be good surgeons <laughs> yes well ladies would have been sewing um, girls traditionally started sewing um, as early as four years old they would start learning how to do sewing so um, in the fact of sewing food, it was just a different material that you were using. Uh -huh. But it was kind of a fancy pickle, so if you were, you know, when you're at the end of the year and you're harvesting all your grain in and you wanted to put something fancy on the table for the gentlemen, the hired men that are doing all the threshing work for you, it was something really nice to put on the table. Would the family have done a fair amount of entertaining and this would have been their specialty? Um, entertaining wasn't extremely common. You got together, you kind of saw people on Sundays, but that really was the only time that you kind of interacted with other people. Um, farmers were kind of solo. <laughs> they had neighbors, but they were, you know, a couple miles apart, and you, you didn't really see your neighbor's house. You saw the edge of his property, you saw the edge of yours, but you didn't really see his house. Um, but, you know, you did have times when you would get together. Like I said, Sundays you'd see people. Um, special occasions, like the 4th of July, was a big occasion to get together. Um, you know, like I mentioned about threshing, when you're going through and separating the grain. Um, you know, if you had a machine, like Oliver Kelly would have had a, a threshing machine, and other farmers who didn't have a threshing machine would come over to use the thresher, you know, that would be a time when there would be more people and you'd have some more interaction. So. Um, so yeah, we've got our pickles in here, and then um, in the other room we've got um, lots of very big bins, um, and it's just for those root crops that you pull right out of the ground and you just stick them in a bin. Um, a lot of times we would cover them up with uh, dry sand to help block out all of that light, kind of keep them in the environment they were already in, and then that just really was the way to preserve um, your root crops. Everything above the ground had to be pickled, everything below the ground you could just store in bins. There wasn't a lot of extra work to them. Well, Andrea, I want to thank you. This has been most educational uh, learning about 1850s, 60s farming and the hard work it involved. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota, shalomhillfarm.org.